Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to the latest Phase 3 Meets episode. Um, this week, uh, it's my pleasure um, to be joined by Rob Bromage, um, who is the founder and CEO of Intelli HR, um, an Australian-based uh, cutting-edge, I think is probably the right term to use, provider of uh, people technology uh, software. So, hi, Rob, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Great to be here, Saad. Great. Just so everyone knows, Rob's actually in uh, in Australia right now. So the timing, God knows what time it is over there. Uh, but if you if you do yawn, that's acceptable. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, uh, I'm all good. And, and I actually have a nice uh, English breakfast tea with me as well to, to help me stay awake. <laughs> there you go. Brilliant. Brilliant. OK, so why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about IntelliHR and, and, and how you've got to to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Uh, IntelliHR, um, I suppose you could probably say, is a, is a people management software as a service application. Um, it came actually out of my consulting business. So, um, you know, for many years doing uh, human capital management consulting, working with companies around improving performance and, and helping them with retention um, and started to build tools basically to support the, the work that I was actually doing. Um, and, and along the journey, I suppose, um, yeah, decided actually I can make this into an application that we can leave with uh, customers so they can actually continue to, to improve their businesses. And it started from that whole, you know, context and, you know, has, has really grown into a full sort of HR platform. So managing everything from, you know, the minute you employ someone to, to um, you know, retirement, so to speak, um, um, all their actual compliance, all their performance enablement. And um, I'm a little bit of a data geek, uh, Asad. So uh, um, we kind of say our actual platform has been built analytics first. So it was all about surfacing information at the right time to the right people in the right way. So um, okay. yeah, a, a big factor about trying to help businesses look after their people and create better workplaces. Okay, you mentioned analytics there as well. I know that's that, that's key for you guys and the, the various solutions you have there. Can you just explain a little bit more about um, how the analytics within IntelliHR uh, helps companies make those better data-driven decisions that you just touched upon there? Yeah, look, um, the, the cool thing is a, a lot of businesses actually don't have access to data. So um, a lot of our typical customers that have come onto the platform, um, you know, really all they had was a payroll system or benefit system. Um, you know, so those administrative HR tools and, yeah. and nothing strategic. So, um, you know, looking at performance and feedback, um, they were either disparate systems or they were manual and paper. Um, so basically, IntelliHR sort of coming from that analytics first, it's, well, what are all the core metrics and the core data that actual business needs to know, um, you know, to focus on culture, you know, focus on those financial, you know, drivers, um, yep. you know, better workforce planning, um, you know, compliance, risk and compliance is a big factor. And, and then how can we actually support a business to automate those processes to serve, um, you know, data and then present the data in a way that, um, you know, I suppose customers can actually understand it. Our customers aren't data scientists and, you know, yeah. they're not HR yeah. analysts, they're, they're awesome at running their business, awesome at looking after their people. So our job was about building guided analytics. Um, here's the content, this is how you should think about it um, and, and make it really easy for them to have a, a, a data-driven business um, and, you know, not only just a tool that provides it, but actually, you know, helps with the collection and actually helps with the adoption um, of the tools and, and improves employee experience. Okay, excellent. And and then customer wise as well, do you do you have any kind of what's a, what's a typical customer look like? Is there such a thing as a typical customer? I suppose there probably isn't, but any any specific industries or size yeah. of organization FTE based? Uh, there's, there's a real cool story to this. Um, okay. You know, when, when I built the platform, I wanted to prove, um, you know, if you care about your people, then you need IntelliHR. Uh, if people are important to the success of your business, then you need IntelliHR. So I really wanted to prove that our everybody that goes to work is important to the organisation. Okay. Um, you know, so I wanted to make sure that we were actually industry agnostic. Um, you know, so with that, um, we've got everything from, um, you know, logistic transport businesses in 
into, um, you know, um, laundry services, into mines, all the way into professional services and financial services, um, some just a real exciting array of industry. So nearly every industry there we've got covered, um, some passionate ones that I'm passionate about and in around, you know, support and care, um, you know, um, so... Yeah, so if you employ people, they're important to you, um, then then we're a really good platform, um, you know, for you. Um, we do tend to find our customers have an enterprise payroll system, um, and okay. you know, and that sort of they've just made that transition from a small sort of business or small yeah. payroll system into something more significant. Uh, and it's really at that time that they start to also then think about uh, the rest of their uh, people management tooling. Um, you know, so so that's where we sort of fit in quite nicely. So um, the other interesting thing thing and which has been big for us, I suppose, and it's been very difficult for businesses worldwide through, you know, the, the pandemic. But um, if you can't see your people, then IntelliHR was always important. Um, and, you know, so our customers typically were global businesses because um, people are in multiple sites and locations. So, you know, our tools around alignment and goal setting and continuous performance and, and, and listening tools really uh, enabled, you know, supporting distributed workforces. And our company's gone through massive growth through the pandemic because suddenly every business technically became a global business, um, you know, with remote work really being the only way that people can can do work. Okay, and you you touched upon obviously being a global uh, or working with global businesses there, and perhaps people watching this are thinking, Assad, what are you doing introducing us to to a company based in Australia? Um, okay. But of course, you guys do have a global footprint. Um, so maybe just uh, let us know a little bit about that and, and what your plans are for kind of expansion. Yeah, um, a little bit like um, the industry agnostic, um, you know, um, we wanted to be a global business. We didn't want to be a Brisbane software company or Australian software company. We want to be a, a global software company because today's businesses operate in a global marketplace. Um, but from the outset, everything we did around our product was actually being about um, non-jurisdictional, uh, if that makes sense. So when we built the product, we didn't do anything in payroll because it's very jurisdictional to a local geography. Um, likewise, funnily enough, with recruitment, we, we didn't do anything in that space. Um, and we we didn't do learning content because those systems were all very jurisdictional and we occupy all of the rest of the space uh, in between all of that looking after um, businesses and yeah we, we've now have I think that the numbers are over 41 percent maybe uh, of our subscribers uh, are out of you know Australia um, and we've expanded very fast um, in, in Northern America particularly in the last yeah. quarter um, having put a, a team together in Toronto um, and um, so we're now servicing um, um, the Northern American market, so Canada, US, and also the UK um, from from the Toronto office. Um, our expansion plans, um, and, and you've kind of got the pre-COVID, and then you've got the you know living yeah. with COVID. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah, we're putting a team obviously in Northern America. Then we're um, you know straight to, our, our plans were straight to be into the UK and then Europe as well. So um, we're just now um, I suppose firming up our team uh, in Northern America and obviously supporting the UK from there. Um, but once we can uh, get back on planes um you know we'll be looking to to get our team um up and running also in in the uk and, and then another one in into europe wow excellent i wish you good luck with uh, with those plans looking forward to seeing how that works out uh, certainly post covid if there ever is going to be a post covid um no. but uh, what, one of the things i really like about these these uh, videos that i do um is is getting to know the real person behind it and and obviously in this intro um i introduced you as the founder and CEO. A lot of these videos are CEOs, MDs, but you're the founder as well. So tell me about your your kind of history and, and you know, I'm assuming you've had loads of ups and downs along the way and you, you mentioned you had a consulting business as well. So what was your kind of motivator behind wanting to, 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 to have your own business? Yeah, um, I suppose um, I, I've always been, um, how would you put it, uh, creative or innovative uh, in, in okay. a manner of speaking. Um, you know, so my consulting business, um, you know, very focused. I've always been very passionate about people. So, you know, that was about helping businesses understand their people better um, and actually having a, a better relationship between their leaders and team members, um, um, you know, and, and I suppose extending that into building software. Uh, I, I think I go back almost 20 years now 
now uh, of actually building software. Um, wow. You know, first system I was involved with was was building a, a recruitment, you know, software application. Would you believe? So all the the scoping and um, you know bringing all that together. And the second um, you know software application I built was uh, uh, an online timesheeting system and you know uh, smartphone enabled. You know, just as smartphones were coming out, um, um, you know, I was just looking for better ways to to do things off the back of all of that. And and then Tally HR, I actually firstly built it as a consulting tool um and uh and then flipped it into um into being an application for for businesses because because again i i I think um from a consultant you can support businesses understand you know where they can improve things and um then you go away and nothing you know sometimes happens so uh leaving a business with a tool that can actually help them continue to improve um is is really what i was actually passionate about um you know and i know you know building a business (laughs) yeah yeah i I think you're right it's there's lots of up and down and in a, in a software business, um, it's actually all about capital and, you know, it's all about people. So, you know, we're a knowledge organisation. We're, we're an organisation full of brilliant people, um, yeah. you know, and I don't think we would be where we, we are if it wasn't for the talents of the, the team members. So from a priorities perspective, it's actually looking after my own people first. Um, yeah. And, you know, as a leader, it makes life easy when you always prioritise your people first. Um, yeah. You know, that that's the first part. And, um, you know, but building onto that, um, you know, particularly a SaaS business, growing in Brisbane, Australia, um, there was very, not many other SaaS businesses and, um, you know, raising capital and, and, and building, I suppose, corporate awareness. Um, mm-hmm. You're educating people about things that they're not really familiar with. Um, so yeah, look, probably the the biggest challenge has been um, the business planning, the 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 funding of the business, um, the education of the investment community, as much as the the, the customer community, in and around what's probably yeah. been a little bit more of an edgy unknown. Um, but um, you know uh, the the persistence, resilience, um, you know, focusing on what we're actually trying to achieve long term and that's having a meaningful, you know, impact on people's lives at work um, and and bringing a team all around that, um, you know, smooths out the the ups and the downs, um, so to speak. It's interesting. I still can't believe that there's businesses and companies out there who haven't figured out the very simple formula. In my mind, it's simple anyway, that, you know, take care of your people. If your people come first, you're you're a people-centric business, everything else falls into place absolutely you know, it, it's such a simple formula and yet there's yeah. companies who, who just can't grasp that no and i say to our team members you know um to them i always say their family comes first and you know at the end of the day they're at work and they're they're you know giving their talents to us to to you know support their own family and grow their, their personal lives so you know whenever something pops up in their lives or well, family first and you know sort that and and then work will always be here tomorrow um you know so if you you take that mentality and and i think you know we're part of a community um our people are part of a community and you know um yeah it's, it's just making our contribution as a as a responsible employer uh, yeah. and, and and social organization as well you know what it's so it, it that that could be something straight out of the phase three rule book family first honestly yes. it it's it mirrors exactly what we say actually as well and i hope when this video goes live and and our guys see that um then yeah no it, that's that's really good because oh, it has and- to be it's the only way in my yeah, and it makes decision making and, and even with your own leaders in the business and, yeah. you know, you know, reinforcing that makes their decisions the right decisions every time. And and you, and you think what we've all been through with the COVID, um, yeah. protecting your people, protecting their family is your number one priority. priority. Um, everything else, you know, will take care of itself is is, is really my rule. And yeah. and I think um, not so much that's only what people care about, but it's, it's really what our responsibility is. And, and you know yourself, like you're responsible for everybody you employ. Yeah. Um, um, and their families, their lives, their their well being, and um, you know, I want to see everybody that we employ uh, be successful in their their personal lives as well, and 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 that's really important. And you know what? It helps you sleep better at night as well, doesn't it? You know, yeah. when you know your decision has been based on putting your people first. Yes. Then that pressure, that potential stress around any kind of people decision making is just gone it's eradicated it's out of the picture isn't it because you know you've done the right thing 
Absolutely, and it gives you clarity. So every decision that you actually make in around, even though how you actually organise your work, um, you know, um, it, it just makes that very sort of simple. Um, and and we're very fortunate, and, and you'd be very fortunate as well with what your business actually does. Um, you know, our, our North Star, our purpose is about helping our customers improve their workplaces and making them better, you know, for, for their people. So, um, you know, we've got a real purpose that, that really brings everybody yeah. along because they're, they're passionate about helping with what we're actually doing. And, and for us, it's just been so exciting. Um, you know, we, we've, we've now got, you know, 30, 40,000, you know, people on our, our platform worldwide. So, um, you know, the, the talents and the efforts of everyone, um, you know, is, is becoming real and, and everything they do is being used by people, you know, worldwide. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, tell us then, what does the future hold for, for IntelliHR? You touched upon, obviously, global expansion, North America, UK. Um, should we expect to continue to see much more innovation from you guys? And absolutely, um, look, I, I'm really passionate about obviously the um, analytics, but in, in particular intelligence augmentation. And you know, yeah. uh, again, it's about really making sense of information across organisations and serving it up. So a big theme through the product at the moment is sort of recognizing we're actually almost content as a service. So how do we actually provide better content to, you know, the people that actually use our system and, you know, that's executives, it's HR leaders, uh, people leaders, uh, and, and, and actual, you know, um, workers and employees in, yeah. in businesses. So, um, and, and that helps, you know, not only transparency, but information in time so people can, can actually, you know, make better decisions and, and, and look after their, their people and their, their businesses. Um, so big theme, you know, continue Continuing to 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 generate insights from our platform, from yep. you know data anomalies that we actually see. Um, you know, we use what we call a data effective data model to to actually look at everything around a person at a point in time, uh, and actually use that to model you know the impact of changes and, and serve insights. So some of that stuff gets gets really exciting. Um, from a, a thought leadership in around people and performance, it's continuing to innovate in around our continuous performance uh, model as well. Um, we are in the final throes of actually bringing in um, um, lang language translation into the platform as well. Um, Excellent. And yeah. Um, yeah, really excited because yeah. um, you know you can preference what language you want, um, and, and that's going to be exciting for businesses, particularly you know those um, e even in one single country where their workforce is you know got real big diversity in around you know language as well. So um, you know so so that's something um, sort of quite exciting that we're actually doing. Wow. Certainly uh, good times ahead then, Rob, and, and very exciting times ahead as well. I'm looking forward to seeing how your journey progresses and um, just, yeah, just, just helping you and supporting you to, to achieve some of those goals. We're looking forward to that. Um, no, so thank you very well, much for the – go on, sorry. I was just going to say, and, and, and again, it, it's been really great working with yourself. Um, there's two businesses that are so aligned from a, a culture and a values perspective. So, um, yeah, I've yeah. really enjoyed getting to know you as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, the feeling Certainly mutual, definitely mutual. Um, we're going to move on to the uh, the quick fire stuff. Um, okay. So just some questions. Where to get I get to nervous. Those, to get to, <laughs> yeah, you should be. You should be. <laughs> um, so we're going to start off quite easy, quite easy on you. Okay. So, um, what's your favourite food? Ooh, nachos. Uh, can't nachos, go past nachos. Okay. Mind you, mind you, it was my my birthday yesterday actually, and I was oh, really happy excited. Birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, thank I won't, you. I won't, I won't ask how old you are. Yeah, no, we don't do that anymore. Uh, but um, no, I love Indian food as well. Uh, Indian and Thai food, um, but uh, nachos is always a, a nice go-to place. Okay, fantastic. Um, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Ooh, ah, oh, this is actually quite sad, Asad. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be a data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, um, early on, I, I actually wanted to be the prime minister, so a politician. <laughs> Um, okay. you know, which is which is you quite funny. Yeah. Quite high then. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Seeing what they Although, do, I'm not how you sure. look at it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but funny enough, actually, my, my first career was a bank banker, so I was in banking, um, you know, for eight years, and I think, yeah, obviously that sort of focus in around numbers and, and data, um, you know, is is a bit of a natural thing for me. Okay, and, and continuing down there, when you were a kid type type theme, uh, what was your worst lesson at school? Ooh, at school. Oh gosh. Um, I suppose. 
I, I think um, I was probably a quiet but naughty um, is is the best way to describe me at school. Um, I actually grew up on a farm, so um, okay. I didn't live in the city, I think, until um, I think it would have been actually grade 12. Um, so, um, you know, free range on, on a farm. And, and I suppose you take that to school a little bit. But um, but um, yeah, the biggest lesson is probably to listen to to the teachers um, and, <laughs> um, and 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 mind you as well, like I, I certainly learnt very quickly if you apply yourself and you do a little bit of study um then um yeah you, you actually get results as well okay fair enough and uh next question i know you already kind of told me you don't know too much about kind of football in the uk um so i'm going to just rephrase the question i was going to ask you uh, we, we, call, ask we you know, call it soccer just just to clarify soccer. and, and yeah, i will well, you say know, you're, you're my, wrong, my, my, but fine. my favorite my favorite sport to to watch live is football slash soccer it is absolutely amazing uh okay. we had the asian cup out here a number of years ago i, I literally went to nearly every single game uh, that was actually played locally in, in brisbane um absolutely okay. love it and is, is that actually your favorite sport then or do you have a, a preferred kind of sport like maybe cricket or something else um i watch all sports so sad um yeah. absolutely all sports i can just sit there um it's quite relaxing uh, i do get into it as well in terms of you know i always pick a team to, to go with um if i look at probably more of a, a global sport that I, I actually love i love car racing so formula one is is F1, absolutely okay awesome. um yeah, yeah absolutely love watching that and and just even there like what goes in the teams and the effort to to actually yeah. make one car one driver um you know win a championship is it's absolutely fascinating and then and then again watching it all play out is, is brilliant okay excellent um Last couple of questions now. So, um, what was your view on Brexit? Oh, <laughs> an Aussie watching from the outside is. Uh, yes. <laughs> I look. I, I can certainly say. I suppose politically, it was uh, difficult to to watch. I think. Um, you know what what you know what it did to some of your leaders. I think some incredible quality leaders. Um, you know, but um, yeah, outside of that, um, you know, from a business perspective, it actually probably in, in dealing with with uh, the UK through all of that, um, there was a little bit of confusion, but it's starting to slowly, um, you know, come to normality. Um, so, yeah. you know, um, yeah, so no real political opinion apart from yeah. I could see that was really difficult for everybody um, at, at all sort of levels and, and a lot of confusion. But um, I can see it's you're coming out the other side, which is which is great. Yeah. That's really interesting to hear, actually, from your point of view, in terms of trying to set up something in the UK during that period and and how things changed. And it sounds like there wasn't too much confusion on your side or, or kind of red tape or changes. Was it, was it reasonably straightforward? Yeah, some of our customers, there was a lot of confusion in around like GDPR and, and particularly with our software application. Yeah. Um, you know, data sovereignty, a lot of the rules and so forth in around all of that and, and a little bit of separation from that. Um, certainly seems like what's in place now is is very consistent with GDPR in, in some regards. Um, so it's probably some of the legislation sort of side of things. Um, a lot of our customers with people in the UK or in Germany and France, um, you know, there was a bit of confusion in around what that meant for them. But, um, okay. yeah, we, we all work forward, you know, through it. Um, so um, and and again, obviously Australia and and, and um, UK are very close together as as countries at a, yeah. at a trade level at, at actually even just a people level. You know, at the end of the day, of um, yeah. So, um, I think we both uh, like either, each other's climates in in some regards. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I was having a chat with someone before, and and I'm I, you're, I'm excited by what your summer looks like. You know, um, the the sun being up till 10 p.m. at night. Um, in in our summer, you know, you're lucky to see it go through to about 7 p.m. So um, just a different lifestyle. Yeah. Parts, the, yeah. the, the sun is up but it's not warm that, no. it's not hot that's the only problem it's bright but you know we we could get so the longest day of the year is like june 21st um and and it could be raining just as much as it could you know the sun could be shining you just have no idea no well, I, I was there a few years back and i was i will say i was entertained it was almost like four seasons in the one day and on one particular yeah. day and, and then and as soon as the sun came out the people came out um yeah. you know, the, the park were full and there was people everywhere. It was, it was absolutely amazing. So um, oh, look, I look forward to the days when parks will be full and we're actually allowed to go outside yeah. again, let alone yeah. just the summer. But that's uh, OK, cool. And final question. Sure. Neighbours or home and away? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to offend people here, but neither. <laughs> neither. You know, I've got, it's, it's a ridiculous question. I'm going to tell you a very geeky fact. Right. Okay. So, when I was at school, um, 
this must have been kind of what we call uh, primary junior school. So pre-11 years old. Um, Neighbours was like a huge thing over here, but it was only on TV in an afternoon slot, early afternoon slot where kids would be at school. So I used to pretend I was ill at home. And my mum, God bless her, was, was a bit on the soft side, you know, typical kind of mum. And she'd let me stay off. And I'd blag it just so I could watch Neighbours until okay. they started introducing a late afternoon slot after school. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I was a bit of a geek, you know, yeah. when it comes to Neighbours and stuff like that. Well, and uh, I, <laughs> I will say, growing up, yes, I, we did watch Neighbours. Um, so uh, not, not, not home and away. So I, I will profess um, I, I would probably be in that camp, but, but I'm not going to own up to it. Um, I, I was, it's, it's actually exciting. At the moment. My kids are starting to get to an age um, and, and the things they're watching are absolutely hilarious. Like my son's right into Friends. Uh, so we're, we're doing uh, <laughs> binge sessions of going through Friends. Uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, you know, fun to go through. I suppose th- for me anyway, that was probably what I was watching growing up more so. Friends is, yeah, no, Friends is, is, I like the later ones better than the earlier ones, I think. Um, but, but no, that was, Friends is fantastic. Um, Going back and watching they're hilarious, absolutely hilarious. So. Some of them, yeah, no, my, I, 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 anything that Joey does, I just find hilarious. <laughs> Especially when he's trying to speak French. Yeah. <laughs> um, that one when he's trying to speak French and he just can't copy, but there you go. Um, Rob, thank when you. He's, uh, Chandler yeah. in, a, in a wooden box, that was even funnier. <laughs> oh, crazy, craziness. Oh, um, Thank you so much for your time. Um, if people want to get, if people are watching this and they want to get in touch with you guys, maybe arrange a demo or speak to someone, what's the best thing to do? Just go through your website. Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, if anyone wants to connect with me, they can yeah find me as Rob Bramage on on LinkedIn. Um, so I'll see the one in, in Brisbane, Australia. Um, but yeah, feel free to connect and happy to, to, to chat. Um, in terms of, you know, IntelliHR, so IntelliHR.com uh, is the best way to get to our website. And um, yeah, you can have a look at the, the product. We've got three different plans, actually. We've got product around employee engagement, product around just pure performance enablement, um, continuous performance. And then we've got a full strategic HR product. Um, but yeah, they can request a demo and have a look at the product on, on the website as well. Okay, excellent. And you can also find IntelliHR on the Phase 3 Connect yes. platform as well. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us, follow our kind of LinkedIn page, keep watching these videos, comment, interact with us. Um, and we'll obviously be back um, next time for the latest video. But for this week, again, Rob, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you, sir. I'll let you get to bed or whatever your plans are now. <laughs> I know you're not actually going to go to bed now, but um, I'll let you get off. And uh, yeah, catch you up soon. Cheers. Love. Thank Bye. you. Cheers.